Hello, my scholars and saints. So today I come to you with Socrates' speech from Plato's Symposium because I need to turn in an outline slash rough draft of my paper that I haven't written in the next, I don't know, maybe it should have been turned in like at five and now it's about six, but you know, we're doing what we can. <laughs> um, this is for my Hegel, Marx, Nietzsche class, and we're writing our second essay, and this time on the dialogue between Marx and Hegel, or I guess it could just be on Marx, but I'm looking at what both Marx and Hegel say about love, but first I want to have an understanding of what uh, philosophers, like how they define love. And I asked my professor for ideas of philosophers who speak about love, and he just said, just use Plato's Symposium. And so I said, okay, that, that does make sense. I mean, this, this one is about love. I asked him about using Kierkegaard as well, but he was like, no. <laughs> so, all right, uh, fair enough. Um, if you have any philosophers who talk about love that you think would be helpful, drop them in the comments below and I might include them in my paper. So let's just see what uh, Diotima, oh, Dio, how does, how does Michael Sugrus say it? I think he has actually, Michael Sugru, the famous professor on YouTube, um, who has sadly recently passed away, has a lecture on Plato's Symposium, The Dialectic of Reason, Love, and Wisdom, which I think sounds really great. And uh, I haven't listened to that one yet. So I need to as well. But I saw, or I like briefly watched a few other videos. I was saying her name Diotima, but Diotima? Let's just say Diotima. Diotima pronunciations. How do you pronounce it? I'm going to say it like all different ways, I think. Okay, let's start. I think that though her thesis is that, well, she doesn't think, first of all, that love is a god. She thinks that love is a spirit somewhere halfway in between gods and humans. And uh, she says that love's doing is birth and procreation in an attractive form, I think, is what she says. I read that. I, I read this. I read this a long time ago, and apparently I didn't digest it um, as much. But I was reading it just now, trying to read through it, and I thought, you know what would be more fun is to read it with all of you. Okay, so let's get started. Let's see what she says. Um, Let's see how I pronounce her name. So Socrates has just heard all of his friends' speeches. They're trying to define and describe um, the god of love. I think it might be, this might be happening on a festival of some kind. Um, yeah, I don't know. So anyway. He says, I'll leave you in peace now, but there is an account of love which I heard from a woman called Diotima, who came from Mantinea and was an expert in love, as well as in a large number of other areas too. For instance, on one occasion, when the Athenians performed their sacrificial rites to ward off the plague, she delayed the onset of the disease for 10 years. She also taught me the ways of love. And I'll try to repeat for you what she told me. I'll base myself on the conclusions Agathon and I reached, but I'll see if I can manage on my own. Oh, the ever humble Socrates. And how very cool that, you know, this is, this is a lady teaching Socrates something, dropping some knowledge. I think that in 2024, maybe it shouldn't be exciting, but it's still exciting. As you explained, Agathon, it's important to start with a description of love's nature and characteristics before turning to what he does. And Diotima has some interesting and surprising, provocative, shocking perhaps, 
ideas on how love should be described. Love who's not a god. I think the easiest way for me to do this is to repeat the account the woman from Mantinea once gave me in the course of a question and answer session we were having. I've been saying to her in my own words almost exactly what Agathon was just saying to me, that love is an important god and must be accounted attractive. She used the same arguments I used on him to prove that it actually followed from my own ideas that love wasn't attractive or good. What? I exclaimed. Do you mean to tell me, Diotima, that love is repulsive and bad? You should be careful what you say, she replied. Do you think that anything which isn't attractive has to be repulsive? Yes, I certainly do. Do you also think that lack of knowledge is the same as ignorance? Haven't you noticed that there's middle ground between knowledge and ignorance? What middle ground? True belief, she replied. Don't you realize that as long as it isn't supported by a justification, true belief isn't knowledge, because you must be able to explain what you know, but isn't ignorance either. Because ignorance can't have any involvement with the truth of things. In fact, of course, true belief is what I said it was. An intermediate area between knowledge and ignorance. I think it's interesting that she is charting a path of the middle way. I don't know why at this point, but that's what she's doing. You're right, I said. Stop insisting, then, that not attractive is the same as repulsive, or that not good is the same as bad. And then you'll also stop thinking that just because, as you yourself have conceded, love isn't good or attractive, he therefore has to be repulsive and bad. He might fall between these extremes. Still, everyone agrees that he is an important god, I said, do you mean every expert, or are you counting non-experts too? She asked. Absolutely everyone. Diotima smiled and said, But how could people who deny that he is even a god admit that he is an important god, Socrates? Who are you talking about? I asked. You for one, she said. And I'm another. How can you say that? I demanded. Easily, she, asked, she said. As you'll see if you answer this question, don't you think that good fortune and beauty are attributes which belong to every single god? Can you really see yourself claiming that any god fails to be attractive and to have an enviable life? No, of course I wouldn't, I said. And isn't it when someone has good and attractive attributes that you call him enviable? Yes, You've admitted, however, that it's precisely because love lacks the qualities of goodness and attractiveness that he desires them. Yes, I have. So this was, uh, so this is in a previous speech where um, it was determined that if you're longing for something, like a lover is longing for the object of love, who is beautiful and attractive and you know all of these wonderful things because otherwise why would you desire then that would indicate that the lover must be lacking in these things because you can't really seek and desire and uh, strive after what you feel you already have so there's sort of like groundlessness which I guess, you know, could be debated, but I think it's, that's an interesting kind of claim. But it's inconceivable that a god could fail to be attractive and good in any respect, isn't it? So first she's trying to argue that love isn't a god. I suppose so. Can you see now that you're one of those who don't regard love as a god? She asked. What is love then? I asked. Mortal? Of course not. What then? He occupies middle ground, she replied. Like those cases we looked at earlier, he lies between mortality and immortality. And what does that make him, Diotima? 
an important spirit, Socrates. All spirits occupy middle ground between humans and gods. And what's their function? I asked. They translate and carry messages from men to gods and from gods to men. They convey men's prayers and the gods' instructions and men's offerings and the gods' returns on these offerings. As mediators between the two, they fill the remaining space and so make the universe an interconnected whole. They enable divination to take place and priests to perform sacrifices and rituals, cast spells and do all kinds of prophecy and sorcery. Divinity and humanity cannot meet directly. The gods only ever communicate and converse with men in their sleep or when conscious by means of spirits. Skill in this area is what makes a person spiritual. Whereas skill in any other art or craft ties a person to the material world. There are a great many different kinds of spirits then, and one of them is love. But who are his parents? I asked. That's a rather long story, she replied, but I'll tell you it all the same. Once upon a time, the gods were celebrating the birth of Aphrodite, and among them was Plenty, whose mother was cunning. After the feast, as you'd expect at a festive occasion, poverty turned out to beg, so there she was by the gate. Now Plenty had got drunk on nectar, this was before this discovery of wine, and he'd gone into Zeus's garden, collapsed, fallen asleep. Prompted by her lack of means, poverty came up with the idea of having a child by plenty, so she lay with him and became pregnant with love. The reason love became Aphrodite's follower and attendant then is that he was conceived during her birthday party. So he is innately attracted toward beauty and Aphrodite is beautiful. Now, because his parents are plenty and poverty, love's situation is as follows. In the first place, he never has any money. And the usual notion that he's sensitive and attractive is quite wrong. He is a vagrant with tough, dry skin and no shoes on his feet. He never has a bed to sleep on, but stretches out on the ground and sleeps in the open in doorways and by the roadside. He takes after his mother in having need as a constant companion. From his father, however, he gets his ingenuity in going after things of beauty and value, his courage, impetuosity, and energy, his skill at hunting. He's constantly thinking up captivating stratagems. His desire for knowledge, his resourcefulness, his lifelong pursuit of education, and his skills with magic, herbs, and words. He isn't essentially either immortal or mortal. Sometimes within a single day, he starts by being full of life and abundance when things are going his way. But then he dies away, only to take after his father and come back to life again. He has an income, but is constantly trickling away. I want to say just one thing oh. about what it is said um, concerning the life-death life cycle, which is how I see it. Within a single day, he starts by feeling full of life and abundance. Things are going his way, but then he dies only to come back to life again. I'm reading um, Clarissa Pinkola Estes, Women Who Run With the Wolves, and she talks about the importance of the life-death life cycle in true love, true intimacy that lasts and is sustained. She says, and I'm not finished with the chapter that this is, um, that is about this, but she gives this uh, mythological tale of this fisherman, I think, who goes to a cliff and, you know, puts his line over into the sea below, and he thinks he is bringing up a big fish, but what he's bringing up is basically a skeleton of bones, and he's terrified, and he tries to become unentangled and run away, but um, this uh, skeleton of bones is, uh, is an ancient, creative, divine woman, 
and uh, basically follows him because she is stuck on his hook. And so he runs inside of his place and she follows him because she's being dragged and she falls on the floor in a heap and at first he's really panicked and frightened and this is a metaphor for um, someone who is maybe uh, scared or hesitant to really enter into vulnerability and intimacy with another person, um, especially maybe during times of a relationship where things aren't perfect or you first notice that, you know, someone has like, I don't know, a blemish on their face or their teeth are crooked or, you know, something that would, uh, you know, people are, you know, literally animals. And so um, there are things about human beings that can disgust someone who has these sort of delusions and fantasies of a maybe a particularly like ideal kind of love that's, uh, you know, that is, uh, I guess, ideal and would ins inspire desire, right? Maybe this is what Diotima is, is, this is why she's saying that, well, love isn't necessarily beauty and attractiveness and, uh, you know, all of these really, really wonderful ultimate things, um, because that maybe can, keep, maybe, maybe she is, Maybe she read Women Who Run With the Wolves in like a different timeline. Um, so, or maybe this is just eternal truth. Um, you know, you will fall out of love then when you are first disgusted by your partner or lover. If you can't, um, you know, or if you were first uh, maybe even disgusted or turned off or angry or disappointed by a conflict or something you find annoying, etc. Like at that time... Uh, Dr. Estes says that in her book that you have to allow a death to occur, maybe the death of the ego, the death of a fantasy, the death of a delusion, and you need to allow a rebirth of uh, maybe a more enlightened um, kind of all-embracing sort of affection and love and connection to another person, you know, or when someone's going through something that's very painful, um, maybe there needs to be a death of how the relationship was uh, up until that point. Maybe it was easy, maybe it was fun, maybe you felt like you were just you know, getting so much from it and now you have to give in a new way that takes energy and effort and time and maybe you have to find a deeper place within yourself of suffering so that you can connect with your lover or your partner. And so there is a death of what you thought the relationship would be and and there are many and this kind of goes on in a, in a long-term relationship. So I think maybe that's what she is talking about now. He has an income, but it is constantly trickling away. And consequently, love isn't ever destitute, but isn't ever well off either. He also falls between knowledge and ignorance. And the reason for this is as follows. No god loves knowledge or desires wisdom because... Gods are already wise. By the same token, no one else who is wise loves knowledge. On the other hand, ignorant people don't love knowledge or desire wisdom either, because the trouble with ignorance is precisely that if a person lacks virtue and knowledge, he is perfectly satisfied with the way he is. If a person isn't aware of a lack, he can't desire the thing which he isn't aware of lacking. But Diotima, I said, if it isn't either wise people or ignorant people who love wisdom, then who is it? Even a child would have realized by now that it is those who fall between wisdom and ignorance. Diotima said, a category which includes love because knowledge is one of the most attractive things there is and attractive things are love's province. Love is bound, therefore, to love knowledge, and anyone who loves knowledge is bound to fall between knowledge and ignorance. Again, it's the circumstances of his birth which are responsible for this feature of his, given that his father is clever and resourceful, and his mother has neither quality. 
I mean, it's kind of unfortunate that it has to be, you know, the woman in this uh, hetero relationship that, you know, is is poverty. But at the same time, if we can look at the spiritual um, meaning of poverty, uh, maybe there is a complete openness and like Taoist flow of generative source. And so, you know, maybe it's not so bad. Uh, I think it's interesting that love would also be between wisdom and ignorance. Because if you think about a relationship that is characterized by love, you wouldn't really want either, right? I mean, you wouldn't want someone to be completely ignorant about the other person or what it is to love someone or how a life together should be. But maybe you don't necessarily want them to be a know-it-all as well, you know? Um, because the point of a relationship, some might say, is to choose a person that you'd like to grow together with, to continue to grow and connect with your soul and to kind of have a partner in doing that and to share that journey. So it does maybe make sense to me now that Diotima is looking at this middle way um, because that's where there is movement. There you are then, my dear Socrates. That's what love is like. Your conception of love didn't surprise me at all, though. Insofar as I can judge by your words, you saw love as an object of love rather than a lover. That would explain why you imagined that love was so attractive. I mean, it's true that a lovable object has to be blessed with beauty, charm, perfection, and so on. But a lover comes from a different mold whose characteristics I have described. And I think that's interesting that she's kind of taking out from love a lovable object and focusing more on this the mode of lover because isn't that what you really want in a relationship that is equal? You don't necessarily want to be the object of love even though you would be worshipped. And you don't necessarily want the other, your partner, to be the object of love. Because again, that's, in, there might be some joy in finding an object of worship that's pleasurable in itself, but it wouldn't be ultimately satisfying. You know, having both of those, uh, having those, that, that duality in a relationship um, would lessen the possibility of reciprocity but if both people if we're thinking about like a, like a couple um and you know romantic love but i guess you can uh you know maybe apply this in some to some extent with any kind of love and i think that she's about to talk about that as well um you'd want both people to be lovers yeah, I think this is really great. I'm, I, I think I can use this definition. It's all, it's all good. Well, Diotima, I remarked, I like what you're saying, but if that's what love is like, what do we humans gain from him? That's the next point for me to try to explain then, Socrates, she said. I mean, we've covered love's nature and parentage, but there's also the fact that according to you, he loves beauty. Suppose we were to be asked, can you two tell me in what sense love loves attractive things? Or more clearly, a lover loves attractive things. But why? Because he wants them to be his, I suggested. But your answer begs another question, she pointed out. What will a person gain if he gets these attractive things? I confess that I didn't find that a particularly easy question to answer, and she went on, Well, suppose the questioner changed track and phrased his question in terms of goodness instead of attractiveness. Suppose he asked, Now then, Socrates, a lover loves good things, but why? He wants them to be his, I replied. And what will a person gain if he gets these good things? That's a question I think I can cope with better, I said. He'll be happy. 
The point being that it's the possession of good things that makes people happy, she said, and there's no need for a further question about a person's reasons for wanting to be happy. Your answer seems conclusive. That's right, I said. Now, do you think this desire, this love is common to all of us? Do you think everyone wants good things to be his forever, or do you have a different view? No, I said, I think it's common to everyone. But if everyone loves the same thing, and always does so, Socrates, she said, why don't we describe everyone as a lover instead of using the term selectively for some people, but not for others? Yes, that is odd, isn't it? I said. Not really, she replied. What we do, in fact, is single out a particular kind of love and apply it to and apply to it the term which properly belongs to the whole range. We call it love and use other terms for other kinds of love. Can you give me an analogy? I asked. Yes, here's one. As you know, there are all kinds of creativity. It's always creativity, after all, which is responsible for something coming into existence when it didn't exist before. And it follows that all artifacts are actually creations or poems, and that all artisans are creators or poets. Right. As you also know, however, she went on, artisans are referred to in all sorts of ways, not exclusively as poets, just one part of the whole range of creativity, the part whose domain is music and meter, has been singled out and has gained the name of the whole range. The term poetry is reserved for it alone, and it's only those with creativity, in this sense, who are called poets. You're right, I said. The same goes for love. Basically, it's always the case that the desire for good and for happiness is everyone's dominant, deceitful love. But there are a wide variety of ways of expressing this love, and those who follow other routes, for instance, business, sport, or philosophy, aren't said to be in love or to be lovers. The terminology with, which properly applies to the whole range is used only of those who dedicate themselves to one particular manifestation, which is called love, and being in love while well, they're called lovers. I suppose you're right, I said. Now, she continued, what if the idea one hears that people in love are looking for their other halves? And of course, here she is referring to Aristophanes' speech on love. What I'm suggesting, by contrast, my friend, is that love isn't a search for a half or even a whole, unless the half or the whole happens to be good. I mean, we're even prepared to amputate our arms and legs if we think they're in a bad state. It's only when a person describes what he's got as good and what he hasn't got as bad that he's capable of being content with what belongs to him. In other words, the sole object of people's love is goodness. Do you agree? Definitely, I said. So, she said, the simple truth of the matter is that people love goodness. Yes? Yes, I answered. But hadn't we better add that they want to get goodness for themselves? She asked. Yes. And that's not all. There's also the fact that they want goodness to be theirs forever, she said. Yes, we'd better add that too. To sum up then, she said, the object of love is the permanent possession of goodness for oneself. You're absolutely right, I agreed. Now, since this is love's purpose in all his manifestations, she said, we need to ask under what conditions and in what sphere of activity the determination and energy of people with this purpose may be called love. What does love actually do? Can you tell me? Of course not, Diotima. I said, if I could, I wouldn't be so impressed by your knowledge. This is exactly what I come to you to learn about. All right, she said. I'll tell you, love's purpose is physical and mental procreation in an attractive medium. I don't understand what you mean, I said. I need a diviner to interpret it for me. 
All right, she said. I'll speak more plainly. The point is, Socrates, that every human being is both physically and mentally pregnant. Once we reach a certain point in the prime of our lives, we instinctively desire to give birth, but we find it possible only in an attractive medium, not a repulsive one. And yes, sex between a man and a woman is a kind of birth. It's a divine business. It is immortality in a mortal creature, this master of pregnancy and birth. But it can't take place where there is incompatibility, and whereas repulsiveness is incompatible with anything divine, beauty is compatible with it. So beauty plays the parts of both faith and aletheia at childbirth. That's why proximity, I don't know if I said that right, aletheia, I think so, that's why proximity to beauty makes a person, a pregnant person, obliging, happy, and relaxed. And so we procreate and give birth. Proximity to repulsiveness, however, makes us frown, shrink in pain, back off and withdraw. No birth takes place, but we retain our children unborn and suffer badly. So the reason why, when pregnant and swollen, ready to burst, we get so excited in the presence of beauty, is that the bearer of beauty releases us from our agony. You see, Socrates, she concluded, the object of love is not beauty as you imagine. What is it then? It is birth and procreation in a beautiful medium. All right, I said. It certainly is, she said. Why procreation? Because procreation is as close as a mortal can get to being immortal and undying. Given our agreement that the aim of love is the permanent possession of goodness for oneself, it necessarily follows that we desire immortality along with goodness. And consequently, the aim of love has to be immortality as well. You can see how much I learned from what she said about the ways of love. Moreover, she once asked me, Socrates, what do you think causes this love and desire? I mean, you can see what a terrible state animals of all kinds, beasts and birds, get into when they're seized by the desire for procreation. Their behavior comes, becomes manic under the influence of love. First, all they want is sex with each other. Then all they want is to nurture their offspring. The weakest creatures are ready to fight even the strongest ones to the death and to sacrifice themselves for their young. They'll go to any lengths, including extreme starvation, if that's what it takes to nurture their young. If it were only human beings, she pointed out, you might think this behavior was based on reason. But what causes animals to behave this way under the influence of love? Can you explain it? When I said that I had no idea, she asked, how do you expect to become an expert in the ways of love if you don't understand this? But that's exactly why I come to you, Diotima, as I've told you before, because I'm aware of my need for teachers. So will you explain it to me, please? And also anything else I need to know about the ways of love? Well, she said, provided you're confident about the view we've expressed time and again about what love aims for, you shouldn't be surprised to hear that the same argument applies to animals as to humans. Mortal nature does all it can to achieve immortality and live forever. Its sole resource for this is the ability of reproduction, constantly to replace the past generation with a new one. I mean, even during the period when any living creature is said to be a living creature and not to change, you know how we say that someone is the same person from childhood all the way up to old age. Although we say this, a person, in fact, never possesses the same attributes, but is constantly being renewed and constantly losing other qualities. This goes for his hair, flesh, bones, blood, and body in general. But it's not just restricted to the body. No one's mental characteristics, traits, beliefs, desires, delights, troubles, or fears ever remain the same. They come and they go. But what is far more extraordinary even than this is the fact that our knowledge comes and goes as well. We gain some pieces of information and lose others. 
The implication of this is not just that we don't remain the same forever as far as our knowledge is concerned either, but that exactly the same thing happens to every single item of information. What we call practice, for instance, exists because knowledge leaks away. Forgetfulness is the leakage of information, and practice is the repeated renewal of vanishing information in one's memory, which preserves the knowledge. This is what makes the knowledge appear to be the same as before. The point is that the continued existence of any mortal creature does not involve its remaining absolutely unchanging for all time. Only gods do that. Instead, as its attributes pass away and age, they leave behind a new generation of attributes which resemble the old ones. This process is what enables a mortal life, a body, whatever, to share in immortality. Socrates, but immortal beings do things differently. So you shouldn't be surprised if everything instinctively values its own offspring. It is immortality which makes this devotion, which is love, a universal feature. In fact, I did find what she had said surprising. So I said, well, you're the expert dial timer, but is what you've been telling me really so? She answered like a true sophist and said, you can be sure of it, Socrates. I mean, you can see the same principle at work in men's lives, too, if you take a look at the status seeking. You'll be surprised at your stupidity if you fail to appreciate the point of what I've been saying once you've considered how horribly people behave when they're under the influence of love or prestige, and they long to store up fame immortal forever. Look how they're even more willing to face danger for the sake of fame than they are for their children. Look how they spend money, endure any kind of hardship, sacrifice their lives. Do you really think that Alcestis would have died for Admetus, that Achilles would have joined Patroclus in death, or that your Athenian hero Codrus would have died in defense of his son's kingdom if they didn't think their courage would be remembered forever, as in fact it is by us? No, they certainly wouldn't. She said, I'm not sure that the prospect of undying virtue and fame of this kind isn't what motivates people to do anything, and that the better they are, the more this is their motivation. The point is, they're in love with immortality. So I want to pause here and make a few comments. I think this is really interesting that what we're seeking is immortality. And I think we can sort of metaphorically understand uh, what she's saying about procreation. Um, she does say physical and mental procreation. And uh, she says that sex between a man and a woman is a kind of birth, so it wouldn't be the only birth. So I think we can extend this beyond, uh, but knowing Plato and knowing Socrates and the idea of, you know, even in his kind of relationships he had with his students, which were somewhat sensual and flirtatious and erotic, um, I find myself a lot of times when I'm reading dialogues, you know, to say just go get a room. That's my annotation more than I would like to admit. Um, you know, it's Socrates' sort of refrain that he never, though, engages in that physical intimacy because he's so preoccupied with the growth of ideas and then his, his own dialectic. And there is definitely a kind of attraction that people have. Um, I think it's called sapiosexual, um, where you're attracted to knowledge and wisdom and conversation. There is a certain kind of intimacy that I've experienced quite a bit when I'm making a connection with someone through just our conversation. And that creates something, right? It, uh, it is a procreation. 
uh, it also sort of makes you feel like you're connecting with source and something beyond you, something that's immortal and divine and eternal and changeless and uh, something that is the most meaningful thing. And you can definitely experience that in the continuum of physical intimacies as well. Um, and, you know, she mentions creativity, I don't think just as an analogous example of categories and kinds, but uh, when an artist is generating something, when you are creating something in your life, um, even when you're walking in nature, it feels like something is being generated. And by talking about love in this way, um, this sort of renewal, um, you know, that knowledge comes and it goes and we gain and we lose and it's a continued existence, but it's changing all the time in a sense, which I guess the other side of that coin would be unchanging as well, because what's unchanging is the continual growth, is the continual possession of a movement toward maybe like deeper and more meaningful connection and understanding, growth, etc. Um, I think this very much relates to the life-death life cycle and also just bringing it to the example of the hero's journey in tarot in the major arcana and how in our lifetime in a single lifetime, we can go from the fool to, I think the last one is the world. And we can return again and again and again to um, a rebirth, to a beginning uh, that is on a maybe like a more elevated, higher or deeper, however you want to, whatever words you want to use, level. Um, but you can have several sort of transformations and evolutions, you know, learning your, your big lessons or the big learning of lessons in your lifetime. And I think that's, you know, really satisfying. It's really satisfying for us as our, you know, selves with a lowercase s, but also satisfying for our souls, you know, the self that is maybe like the higher self, the changeless self, the immortal self with a capital S. All right, so uh, I think that we're actually going to stop there. There's uh, more to come, but we are pretty close to, uh, um, well, we're 43 minutes, 44 minutes in. Um, but I think I've got a good start, at least. My paper is not due, just an outline. I think I'm getting the gist of what she is saying. So if you have any more comments or thoughts about what is being discussed, and maybe I'll do a part two and finish it, but it's getting kind of late, and so I need to put something down so I can submit it. Uh, thank you so much for um, spending time with me and uh, reading with me a part of Plato's Symposium. I think it's a really great classic work. And I love that Socrates' speech is really Diotima's speech. So um, comments below if you want to help me out with any part of my thoughts. And if you, I really didn't talk about like how, what my, well, my thoughts about um, Hegel's ideas of love or Marx's ideas of the inability to find true love in a capitalist regime. But uh, comment on that below as well if you have any thoughts. And I'll catch you next time.